Fighting power, we fighting money. What are you doing? They really wanted this link. Could you see that you're breaking? If you clear out Silver Dollar Road, what you gonna do with us? What you gonna do with poor people? Period. The family can shout from the rooftops. The truth. Nobody will listen to them. Will you hear me before? This is ours. Our ancestors left this here for us. Will you hear my word? All of this is what you're fighting for. Good afternoon and welcome to Washington Post Live and another in our series on race in America, co-produced with the Capehart podcast. I am Jonathan Capehart, associate editor at the Washington Post. In his Oscar-nominated 2016 documentary, I Am Not Your Negro, Filmmaker Raoul Peck turned an unfinished manuscript of James Baldwin's into a celluloid examination of capitalism, racism, colonialism, exploitation, and injustice. Today, Peck is turning that same lens on the Reels family and his powerful examination of the history of land dispossession from black owners in his new documentary, Silver Dollar Road, which was recently screened at the March on Washington Film Festival here in Washington last week. You see him right there. Joining me now is Raul Peck. Welcome to Washington Post Live. Well, thank you for having me. And it is great to see you again. I did a, we did a Q&A together after a screening of I Am Not Your Negro here in Washington, Raul, seven years ago next month. So I wanna pick up the conversation uh, along the lines of what I said in the intro. Tell us who the Reels family is, and how their story exemplifies capitalism, racism, colonialism, exploitation, and injustice. Well, who the family is, uh, I, I think the, the film will do a better job to uh, uh, show what, who the, this family is and what their ordeals have been for all those years. Uh, but for me, the thematic exemplify indeed the core story of this republic. Uh, we know that this country was built on, on land that was stolen uh, from the indigenous people. And we know as well that uh, black people were enslaved uh, to work on that land. Uh, and the whole concept of private property, which came from the European invading this country, uh, became the, the necessary tool for the expansion of capital. So uh, we are touching right there the whole uh, DNA of what this country is. And, and we are living today the result of all this, where you see uh, uh, not only black farmers and poor uh, uh, people, uh, white and, and, and uh, uh, minorities losing their, their field, losing their farms, uh, not being able to, be, to benefit uh, all the uh, institutional program that exists, but also in, in the urban setting uh, uh, through uh, gentrification. Uh, you are living in, in a city that is historically uh, majority black. And when you go through the streets of Washington today, you, you see the, the changes. So mm -hmm. it's the same story that goes again and again that have basically imploded to a, to a state where uh, today, a big chunk of the population don't have the means to sustain themselves, to build any wealth, and to uh, pass that wealth down. Now, you heard about the, you learned about the real story um, from a story that ProPublica did uh, about them and, and reported Black Americans lost 90% of their farmland between 1910 in 1997, we have a clip from Silver Dollar Road that explains how the Reels family was affected by this. Let's take a look. Elijah Reels was my great-great-grandfather. He farmed the property, had a family upon the property. 
And unfortunately, in 1939, he lost the property due to back taxes. His son, Mitchell Wills, then purchased the property in 1944 at the courthouse doors due to back taxes. Unfortunately, in 1970, Mitchell died without a living will, and the property then became the heirs of Mitchell Wills. And that's when all our legal problems started. Heirs' property is property that has been left to an onslaught of family members. So there was a document that was conveyed that my grandmother and her siblings did, in fact, own the 65 acres after a court proceeding. So it was ruled that the 65 acres did belong to the Mitchell Wills heirs. So, Raul, what are heirs' property laws and how do they affect Black landowners? Uh, well, heirs' property laws are basically uh, uh, a non-written law that uh, enable uh, people, you know, when they, uh, when a parent died and on, had on land, instead of writing a will, they would just say, okay, the whole family will inherit the property. But in fact, uh, that fragilized uh, the, the property instead of, you know, because uh, mostly black Americans did not trust the law, you know, uh, after, uh, you know, uh, slavery and emancipation, there is no way most family would trust the, the justice system. So they thought that by not having a will and let, letting the property go into what is called Hare's property, that means it will belong to all the descendants. Uh, it, it creates over multiple generations, it creates problems because there are other laws that exist uh, that enable anybody to find someone that has never lived on the property, but who has some connection to the family to basically ask for its part of the property. And then usually depending on the place, uh, it's either, uh, uh, you know, they separate and sell the whole property uh, on auction, in auction, not at a market price, by the way, most of the time, and the family lose the property, you know, because they are not able to buy uh, uh, most of it. Now, maybe I, I, I missed it in, in the reading. I was having a hard time understanding how is it that someone, uh, someone meaning a family like the Reels family, can not only own a property, but live on it for generations, and yet someone else can buy the property out from under them. Yes, because it's it's a world in itself, especially in smaller community, in counties, where the whole power system uh, basically have ruled for generations. You know, the lawyers, the mayors, the real estate people, uh, and uh, it suffice that one uh, uh, family in that in that uh, in the film, it's uh, uh, an individual called Shadrick who basically came from New Jersey with a will that still today is uh, 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 controversial, despite uh, that the fact that the grandmother had uh, her papers, you know, saying that she's the administrator, she's the the owner of the property. But the, the justice system uh, did allow the mis, uh, how do I call it, the, the misunderstanding that came out of it. And, and Shedrick, in his turn, sold it to promoters. So it became mm -hmm. a society that owns the property so that you have another level of complication. So it happened all the time because the, the system itself allows for that. And, and mm -hmm. there is... There is also corruption. Uh, there are also, uh, uh, you know, uh, laws, local laws that enable, uh, you know, if a family don't pay, uh, let's say you have a property divided into 10 different families and one family didn't pay their taxes for some reason, either because the taxes became more than they can afford. And then you have to auction the whole property. And right there, you have another instance where people who have more money can buy the whole land and the mm -hmm. families have just have to leave. So it's a whole staple of different laws and system and power structure that basically is a mess. And there are many organizations working on that, uh, thanks God, today, 
uh, trying to, uh, um, you know, clear the titles, uh, trying to educate families that they need to write a will, uh, otherwise their descendants going to have a hard time to, to keep the property. Mm -hmm. and, and I know many uh, uh, African American and sometimes white uh, 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 citizen uh, have a similar story in in their life, whether it's the previous generation or even uh, further back. It's mm -hmm. it's really a big problem. And because we are in Washington, I I hope that the the next two, 2023 farm build will continue the program or, and even expand them to allow those organizations to further educate and help funding uh, as well uh, families that uh, wants to you know keep their property and and um, and build some sort of uh, wealth let me read something that you said about black landowners like the reels family you said you know um, that these black landowner landowners built on that land accepting to be on the margin the former enslaved could only buy land that had zero value and they made it productive. Why do you describe the history of land dispossession from black owners as an, an identity issue instead of a land issue? Well, it was never a land issue. And even in the history of, uh, of Europe, you know, land was always the key. It was not only wealth, it was also uh, um, a commodity. As, as soon as land become a commodity, that means it's something you can sell, you can buy, you can transform. Uh, and when the European uh, invaded uh, America, uh, they came with the with that context, that concept as well. And the founding father uh, as well continued that tradition. You know, I remind you that most uh, the founding father were all in some way real estate men. And uh, and all the additional laws always went into that confirming, uh, you know, private property, whereas the indigenous people never said that that land was belonged to them. They always said we are the guarantor of those lands. We are taking care of this land, but they don't. That land don't, doesn't belong to us, and that's a European concept is ingrained you know in the dna of, of this country and uh don't forget after uh, slavery uh, the same thing uh, uh, arrived there were laws that enabled you know like the homestead 1860 uh, law that uh, uh, 62 laws act that enables uh, mostly white a, a, a citizen to uh, acquire land or to you know you could go to 160 acres of land because they knew that's the fundament of any existence, of your identity, of the capacity to accumulate wealth. Mm -hmm. And of course, from there, black people, because they were not uh, accepted as citizens, basically the law did not allow them to, to, to acquire the, those lands. So what was left for most black uh, farmers was uh, to buy cheap land, uh, swamps basically, uh, which would become a few decades later very important, valuable land because first of all they worked on that land, they made it becoming something of value, uh, they invest in it, they, they grow their family on that land, like you, the real family, they didn't need anybody. They could fish, they could hunt, they built their house on the property. Uh, they didn't need anybody's help. They didn't beg for money. They, did, they had their own place. And uh, so when uh, that happened in the South, like where, as you say, the numbers are incredible. Like, uh, you know, most, I think the numbers are more than 14% of farmland were black uh, uh, farmland. And uh, starting the century, 1900, 1920, uh, violence started because now uh, the white population wanted that land mm -hmm. because it was valuable. And that's the thing. People are always talking about the black exodus toward the north as if it was just an incident. It started because of land, mm. because people wanted that piece of land. Well, let's talk about um, um, the storytelling. 
in, in Silver Dollar Road, Road. Why did you choose to tell the story from Mamie and Kim's perspectives instead of Lycurtis and Melvin's? Because yes. like Curtis and Melvin are the two who spent eight years in jail for not leaving the property. Yes. Well, that, that was an artistic and political choice I made very early on. Uh, Lizzie Presser article and research were, were key to that as well, because she did all her work. Uh, she did what I didn't want to do, which was also to inquire about what I call the other side, you know, the, the, the promoters, the people owning the, the, that portion of land, uh, the, the mayors, the scholars. She, she really uh, interviewed everybody. So it was through that archive that I had, the, that research, that I thought I need to concentrate on a film that will tell that story and through the real family themselves. And very early on, the two women, Kim and and, uh, and Mami, were such incredible characters and uh, storytellers, and they were the one really uh, doing most of the job and and keeping the family together, making sure that they get the lawyer, making sure that the papers are in 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 order, and and I couldn't pass that, you know, and and I my decision was. That's their story, and they need to tell them themselves. So, uh, so I did. I took that decision very early on, and as you can see, you know, they are incredible. They are funny. They are powerful. They and they tell their own story. So, uh, the part of the question about the two brothers, like Curtis and Melvin, it's because I didn't want to make it a victim story or a crime story, because it's it's larger than that. I wanted to establish the family as a human family, as, as a family that could be yours, mine, and, and find the time to have empathy for them. And, and also not to go in the normal structural uh, US documentary where we tend to contain a story and make it very personal. And then we can uh, emphasize with it, but then after the film is finished, we can go home and okay, that was a beautiful story. I I really try hard not to get in that trap and make sure that I introduce you to a family, you learn to know who they are, and hopefully you learn to love them as, as I do, and and then come the drama of of this land that they are losing. But you know their life is not going to stop. They, they are continuing their life. They, you know, the whole family, uh, they have a life beyond that. And the fight is just part uh, uh, of that life. And, and so I didn't want to end the film into a happy end. It's, there is no happy end so far I can see. It's, it's the, the fight continue for them, you know? And I wanted to make sure that their life is, is told by them and, and, and see as something that is a continuum. And, you know, you mentioned the name Lizzie Pressler, and she is the reporter from ProPublica uh, who wrote the initial story um, um, that is the foundation of Silver Dollar Road. And in a sort of a, a post-story um, interview that you did with her, picking up what you were just saying, you say, if you don't understand the price, the real toll on the whole family, if you can't identify with the people, you will just have pity that I want you to have a connection and I want the anger to be your anger anger about the injustice so it's felt as an injustice to you too. One thing we didn't talk about in terms of you know, all the legal machinations is how lawyers treated the family in, in all of this, whether it was attorneys overcharging them uh, and leaving the case altogether or paralegals and clerks forgetting who they were when they just saw them the week the week before what did that behavior show you well it's it's uh, those are behavior that people might know in smaller community where everybody knows everybody and even lawyers that were defending the family at some point they were put in into pressure because uh, powerful people said you know uh, this family is not uh, obeying our laws. It, uh, they are becoming a pain in the neck. And 
uh, you cannot defend them. Uh, and when you leave, uh, you make your bread in a small community, you know, you said, okay, I have to leave the case. You know, that's all sort of pressure, the same way uh, Melvin Boats was, was uh, uh, um, you know, uh, attacked and bombed. You know, nobody know to this day who did that. So it's a, it's a very, um, you know, close knit community. And as long as the story stay in that small community, you know, a lot of things can happen because uh, people are a bit uh, defenseless uh, mm -hmm. face to that. And mm -hmm. um, so I hope, and that's the hope of the family as well, to make this story bigger to a wider audience that will protect them a bit as well, you know, because that those two men spent eight years in prison and, and, and you have to know when they went into prison, they didn't know if they were going to be there for 30 days, 90 days, but maybe a year, but that would never occur to them. But mm -hmm. imagine they did eight years, almost eight years without knowing the end of it. They could have been there indefinitely. You know, you know in, in my reading up on this, I, can't, I think it was Melvin, neither one expected the outcome in the courtroom that day that they were going to jail. And I think it was Melvin who even went to the courthouse, didn't even lock his doors because he figured he would be back later that day. I want to talk about your, your Raul, your personal connection you may have felt um, with the Reels family, because in an interview with Vanity Fair, um, last month, you said this could have been Haiti, it could have been Congo, any of those places where I've gone and, and met the family, the uncles, the nieces, the aunties, grandmother, the parties, the barbecue. I've lived through that with many different families, so I didn't feel that I was not at home. What did it mean to you to be with these people who are of no relation to you, but feel like that they are, they are of relation to you? Well, first of all, because they were welcoming, you know, uh, when I met them the first time, it was uh, uh, grandmother Gertrude, uh, 95th birthday. So family member came from all the all over the United States. So it was a, 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 a big moment for everybody. And, and I was introduced there through Lizzie, who, uh, you know, she had been there like almost three years uh, back and forth with the family. And and I saw how they adopted her, you know, a, a white uh, a urban uh, young journalist. And, and I, I, I watched them uh, behaving with Lizzie, how they welcomed her. And I felt she was the daughter of the family. And all that, you know, it's, it's, it's despite the trauma, despite the problems, the, the, the type of human relationship I felt there, I really, uh, I'm not ashamed to say, I fell in love with them. And 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 I felt the warmth of that community, and and they and they made everything possible to make my life with them uh, making this film uh, really agreeable. And and I understood when the film was finished what it meant. Also, when I I screened the film for them, a, a small group, the the close family, uh, we went to Raleigh to make a you know uh, to make the screening for them. And uh, we were having lunch after that, and Mamie said something that really warmed my heart because she said, now a big weight is uh, not anymore on my shoulder because now somebody else is telling the story, mm. you know? And, and, and I understood what this came from because, mm. you know, that they opened their hearts, they opened all the, you know, those moments in the film that are very intimate, you know? You, you have to trust somebody to let a camera right. come to your home like this. Right, and, exactly. And we, exactly. of course, had to be very discreet. We made sure that they were at ease. And, and but it, it's, so it's a common uh, uh, production, I would say. You know, it was really a family, family uh, 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 project. Mm -hmm. You know, I've got two big questions and about mm, a little more than five minutes, and I'm going to squeeze them in. in. In the documentary, I Am Not Your Negro, you feature this timeless quote from James Baldwin, who said, white people are astounded by Birmingham. Black people aren't. 
white people are endlessly demanding to be reassured that Birmingham is really on Mars. They don't want to believe, still less to act on that on the belief that what is happening in Birmingham is happening all over the country. In North Carolina, the Reels family continues to this day to fight for their land. As you reflect uh, on them, what do you want viewers to take away from their story and how it fits into this country's history? Yeah, well, for me is, and, and I've said that to, to uh, some of the audience in the discussions that uh, I hope the film will help you also uh, interrogate who you are, because we all come from one land, one piece of land. You know, you just need to go back a few generations back. So, uh, and, and understand that is your identity as well. You know, whether you are in New York, Chicago or elsewhere, I've, you always hear somebody say, I'm going back home. So what it means home? What is the symbolic uh, uh, value of that home? You know, where do you come from? Can, can we all uh, answer that question? So it's, it's part of who we are and it's important to know not only our history, but what role did we play in that history? You know, whether we are black, whether we are indigenous, whether we are white, you know, are we just uh, blind citizens? Do we just make, you know, say that it was always like this and, and it will continue? No, it was not always like this. You know, that land has a history and each citizen, if you want to earn the, the denomination citizen, you need to be interested in that uh, history. You know, Raul, for the uninitiated who might not know your entire your entire history, um, you were um, a, you are a former Haiti Minister of Culture back in '96 and '97. Yeah. And I bring that up because on October 2nd, the UN Security Council authorized the deployment of a Kenya-led security mission to Haiti to help police uh, um, to help the police there fight armed gangs as a as a former Haitian minister, what are your thoughts on this decision in the future uh, of the I'm country? Enraged. I'm enraged by this decision and all the stakeholder knows exactly what's going on, except everybody's care to take the responsibility of what they did. Uh, having, you know, all my life I've knew of interference from uh, the Europeans and from the United States in the Haitian affair. Uh, and, uh, they disregard the four years effort of the civil society to bring up a solution that would be legal, that would be uh, help the whole population to go back to vote. Uh, and all that have been pushed back, even though President Biden accepted uh, the notion of a Haitian led solution. But uh, in the background, they have done everything to ignore uh, this uh, civil society that say no to the continuum of illegality of a prime minister that was never elected, but who is still being supported by both uh, the American embassy and uh, the European uh, Council. So it's it's uh, what do they think going to happen? They think the Haitian going to accept uh, uh, what we called in Haiti an intervention. Uh, even if it's hidden uh, behind Kenya, another country with lots of problem, the human rights uh, 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 record of the Kenyans police is is so bad, and and everybody does as if it's normal. You know why did Canada did not lead that mission? Why did the United States did not lead that mission? Because they know how uh, uh, how it doesn't make sense. And they well, know that it's going to create even more problems. Well, Raul, I just want to point one thing out. The, the UN re uh, resolution um, that authorized this, um, according to reporting in the Washington Post, was written by the United States and, and Ecuador. That doesn't give you any, any confidence. Uh, a very powerful country. So we know who was holding the pen. So, and by the way, the US is giving 100 million to that uh, mission. Why are they the one pay to pay? So it, I mean, we would need at least five hours to to the, uh, to talk about that. But the, the bottom line, when a former Biden envoy to Haiti after the assassination of the president, uh, Mr. Daniel Foote, 
resign after three months. And basically, I recommend everybody to read his resign resignation letter. Basically, he says, our whole policy toward Haiti have been wrong. We still have the obris that we, the United States, need to decide who is going to be the next president in Haiti. And that's unfortunately the whole history of the relationship between the US and Haiti, starting with uh, supporting dictatorship in Haiti, up to today, where the only policy that seems to make sense to the administration is to send back uh, refugees. You know, that prime minister today uh, is there because he accepts to take back refugees the same time uh, the American embassy is telling all Americans in Haiti to leave the country. But every day there are still loads of airplanes bringing back refugees to a torn and, and, uh, uh, country where Haitians are hiding at home. The, the capital is invaded by 80% uh, 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 of the capital is in the end of gangs. So the solution, right. if you think you're going to send boots, without negotiating with the civil society, we know all uh, what it's gonna be. That's why the UN, it's not even a UN mission because everybody is scared of that. They know exactly it's another Mogadishu, you know? And Ra Raul, as you said, we would need another five hours to have this part of the conversation and we don't we don't have five hours, but we're gonna have to leave it there. And, and thank you for having asked me about Haiti because it's important to my heart. I work every day with the civil society there and and it's a shame what's happening and i hope actually the washington post could do a better job of reporting on haiti we will we will take that advice raul peck director of silver dollar road great to see you again thank you very thank much you. for coming to k-part on washington post live thank you for your invitation and thank you for joining us to check out what interviews we have coming up go to washingtonpostlive.com once again, I'm Jonathan Capehart, Associate Editor at The Washington Post. Thank you for watching Capehart on Washington Post Live.